So welcome to the <clears throat> afternoon session of the review of the Sadhana. And again, if you do not have the initiation of Vajragini, uh, please don't watch this. There's no benefit for you. If you are interested, please seek out the initiation. Uh, that applies mostly to you who are watching later on YouTube. Okay, so again, <clears throat> although we don't have to see it, we can just believe or, you know, just believe we are in an incredibly vast palace, like a space, a vast space. <clears throat> in front of us, we have Guru Chakrasambara Vajogini, Dharma Dorji, uh, uh, Dharma Vajra Dharma, uh, Buddha Vajra Dharma. Uh, we have a sense of connection with all sentient beings. And often when you're doing something for someone else, it's, it's uh, got a lot of benefit, a lot of power in our, our intention because it's not about us, it's about them. Especially when you love that person, then, then it's very strong. You know, if you think about your, your, if you have a child, I mean, you'd walk 10 miles to get some medicine for your child if that was in this city because that's power of love. So in the same thing, I mean, although, you know, well, we are going for the medicine of enlightenment, be a better person. And so I'm attending for, <clears throat> for some people I love. That's why I'm attending the class. And then you have the seed of bodhicitta, the seed of altruism. So see yourself as Vajugini, uh, no implements. Think of all sentient beings as Vajugini. We're all on the same team. We're in the playground of enlightenment, the pure land playground of enlightenment. In the space before me stands Guru Chakrasambara, Vajogini in union, surrounded by a host of root and lineage gurus, yidams, buddhas, bodhisattvas, dhakas, and dharma protectors. I and all infinite space of beings take refuge in the glorious gurus, from this moment until I reach enlightenment. We take refuge in the perfect Buddhas. We take refuge in the Dharma. We take refuge in the Sangha. I and the infinite space of all beings take refuge in the glorious Gurus. From this moment until we reach enlightenment, we take refuge in the perfect Buddhas. We take refuge in the Dharma. We take refuge in the Sangha. I and the infinite space of all beings take refuge in the glorious Gurus. Take this moment until we reach enlightenment. We take refuge in the perfect Buddhas. We take refuge in the Dharma. We take refuge in the Sangha. Upon attaining the supreme realization of Buddha, I shall free all sentient beings from the endless round of suffering and shall deliver them to the bliss of enlightenment. For that, may I practice the stages of Vajrayani's path. Upon attaining the supreme realization of Buddha, I shall free all beings from the endless round of suffering and shall deliver them to the bliss of enlightenment. For that, may I practice the stages of Vajrayogini's path. Upon attaining the supreme realization of a Buddha, I shall free all beings from the endless round of suffering and shall deliver them to the bliss of enlightenment. For that, may I practice the stages of Vajrayogini's path. I bow down and take refuge in the Gurus and the three precious jewels. Please bless my mind strength. Okay, so. <clears throat> feel that the objects of refuge absorb into you, but again, I mean, you can have uh, Buddha, Vajra, Dharma, Vajrayogini in the space before you giving the teachings. The, um, you may be familiar with <clears throat> taking lay precepts, such as, you know, not to kill, steal, lie, uh, adultery and such, uh, and then Bodhisattva vows. And actually, uh, when you take the lay precepts, whether just one, two, three, four, or five, they're actually placed on your body because when you die, they will stop. And so therefore uh, lay precepts or even monks and nuns precepts all stop at the time of death because if those precepts are upon your body uh, and that would be important because in your next rebirth, you wouldn't you know, want to have the precepts of a monk or a nun <clears throat> and, you know, and then not know because of course you took the rebirth and so then you're creating karma. So it may sound you know strange, but just, those sorts of precepts are on the basis of your body. But bodhicitta, altruism, is on the basis of your mind stream. Now, 
obviously there are, there's precepts and are suggestions for what to do as a bodhisattva, but really it's sort of to, may I be of benefit to myself and to others? You know, may I be more enlightened? Uh, and so that can go to future rebirths. If you remember the original story, well, there's various stories about how Buddha Shakyamuni first gained bodhicitta. Uh, I explained that the one I like the most is a little boy running in the, uh, in the jungles of India. He saw Buddha sound of the drum. And was, he's just five years old and he was just so impressed. He said, I wanna be like that. And the way I often think of it is that into his heart came that light of enlightenment and of with the wish to become enlightened, you know? And then the boy helped, uh, you know, the Buddhist sound of the drum across a river or across a creek and such and received teachings. And then so <clears throat> with that light in his heart, that rebirth, of course, he was very virtuous. And then in the next rebirth, it's not like, you know, you could say certainly the memories, but I often think of it was the light in his heart that like, 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 I saw an incredible being that's really, I think, would be the, the motivational force for the next rebirth and all you know, consecutive rebirths all the way till you became uh, Siddhartha and then finally Buddha Shakyamuni. So uh, when we do uh, prayers like this from this moment until I reached enlightenment, <clears throat> that is the altruistic wish to be of great benefit that goes from here until enlightenment. Maybe if you, you know, study a little bit of psychology, it's very beneficial. Um, for example, they say, happiness there's there's been about i guess now 25 30 years worth of psychological research into being happy because in the past psychology was just looking at being sick so they finally decided well let's look at what it means to be happy <clears throat> so um for example they they, def they put it into four levels and I, I think that this is very meaningful i mean as a buddhist it can be very meaningful that um for example just you know uh, going to a movie eating a meal uh, things like that, that's happiness. It's recognized as happiness, you know. But the thing is, it, it's based on how long you feel happy or contented or fulfilled. So the problem with restaurants and movies and things like that or parties is, you know, you go to the party or you go to the movie and it's over. So although it's happy, happy time, it's short term. Then uh, interesting, the second one is family. And that then is that you know you you <clears throat> you have family, children, and seeing and such, and so it's a longer term happiness. But as we all know, family doesn't mean that things are always going well. I mean, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But there is a, a deeper sense, a longer term feeling of happiness in who you are. Then the third one, interestingly, is a hobby, and the reason for that is because it doesn't involve other people. It's you being really happy with what you do and it could be gardening and you can go out in the garden and spend two or three hours or or the Dalai Lama enjoys uh, taking you know very uh, old old washes apart and putting them back together you know that's his hobby and it gives him a lot of happiness and satisfaction and the reason why that's above family is simply that you know sometimes family can be complicated whereas a hobby generally speaking gives you personal satisfaction and fulfillment and it's more durable that's the point then the final one, and this comes out of psychology, and when I read it, I was really surprised, was this altruism, that you do something for more than yourself, and that will give you the most long-term, durable type of happiness. So uh, being a bodhisattva is, is, the, may, is a very good way to have really long-term sense of fulfillment, satisfaction, and happiness. Even if you're not that good of a bodhisattva, it doesn't matter. You're doing something for greater than yourself. When I thought about it a little bit, I thought, okay, often we think of altruism as like, for example, we believe in God and we're doing the work of God. But when you think about it, it's got this greater context. It's not me. It's, you know, for you know, it's my work for God or something like that, which is this ultimate altruistic idea. And then you could do incredible things, you know, as a Christian. Well, for as a Buddhist, it's all sentient beings. May I help them move towards enlightenment? So it still has a very grand scope or panorama. And so, you know, if we're looking for happiness, yes, go to movies, you know, and have family and, you know, have a hobby. But if you want to make all of them be really long-term, then be altruistic. 
and then you can reverse it. You know, for example, if you're altruistic in your heart and you have a hobby like making you know, wooden toys or things and give them away. And then it's not like you're having a hobby just for your self gratification, which would be good. It'd be, hey, my hobby is for the benefit of many. Or then family. May I help my family be more enlightened? May I help my family be good? And in, in a non sort of grasping way, but just, you know, altruistic feeling of may my, my family be happy. So you can bring altruism to family. And then finally, you can be altruism to going to a movie, invite somebody, or invite somebody to a meal. Again, it's, you know, wish to bring happiness to another person. So altruism is very special. And when we look at bodhicitta, you know, it is very fulfilling emotionally, you know, you know, just even attending today, if you're doing it for more than yourself, it gives you an extra little feeling there. And that, that makes it very precious. So in regards to the in regards to doing this practice, being altruistic is very beneficial. Now, we finished uh, this morning the uh, mental rest or verbal recitations, mental recitations, and such. We then went into the yoga of inconceivability, uh, which is then going to the void. So just remember that you do the mantra recitation. Um, you, know, may, you can feel that you take sentient beings through the stages of becoming enlightened or, you know, well, that, that's one. Then you can make offerings to all the Buddhas, but then first, first identify your gurus, feel they send you lots of support, and then all the beings that are enlightened that maybe you don't know of so much, but they also give you lots of good energy. Then you do the, the two of the completion stage practices, but at the end of the second one, you've disappeared. You know, you are clear light consciousness. So you rest in that. But at the end of that, which is yoga number nine, then you allow yourself to appear again because you have to then do yoga number 10, which you have the form of being Vajogini. And then you do the dissolution, uh, formless realm, form realm, desire realm, all absorb into you. You go to the, well, the bum syllable, the bum syllable to the top, to the crescent moon, to the dot, to the squiggle, and to the clear light. Uh, again, we covered where we will cover that in great detail in the longer commentary. Uh, and then so th then so you do that. So that's at the, the end of yoga number uh, nine. So you need to then become a you take on the so sorry, yoga number nine, you're empty, so you become again Bajogini. By the yoga number 10, you gain absorbed to, to the clear light. And again, then you manifest and you have the uh, uh, well, sorry, the yoga number 11 then is when you re reanimate uh, and you put on your armor and such. Um, I will post the images related with the armor, the syllable bomb and such this evening. It's already all set up to be done. So that those will be posted for you. Then uh, we bless, we have then the two blessings, blessing of the outer offerings, blessing of the inner offering, the ritual cake. Now, <clears throat> again, this is just remember a review of the sadhana. So you do not, you, okay, on your altar, um, you can just have the images. Uh, you could have, you know, uh, let's say one bowl of water, if that's all you had time or, or the thing for, or you can do the eight offerings, you know, water for the mouth, water for the feet, perfume, flowers, and such light for the music, uh, things like that. <clears throat> okay, so that's your, your altar. Uh, and the blessing of the things on your altar. So again, it's similar to what we did at the beginning. Uh, at the beginning. And then we do the inner offering. So inner offering, you could put a cookie, a cake, a candle, or sorry, a cookie, a small cake. Um, I, I like to use a little shot glass like that you put normally whiskey in, but I put in milk because milk is white for pacification of problems. It's a food, okay? And just a little glass is, is all you need. Um, and then you bless that. But you don't actually need to do anything other than if you have your inner offering. You know, if we look at the great Yogi Milarepa, he said, it's very nice if people, uh, you know, give me, uh, you know, food and things to, to so I can live in the mountains. And it's very nice if people offer service to sort of help in whatever way. But the best offering you can make is the offering of your practice. So remember that the inner offering is symbolic of your transformation of your five aggregates into the five Buddha wisdoms, the transformation of all delusions. And so it represents your dharma practice because that's how you do it 
So you can just offer inner offering. And what you're really offering is the supreme offering, your Dharma practice, with that understanding. You know, just offering inner offering, I mean, would be, would be special, but put it in terms of it is your Dharma practice. So that's the, uh, the thing. Then you have the syllable PEM. And there's different, different people do it different ways. Lama Zopa does it a bit more quietly, but I was taught that you should try to scare the birds off the trees around your house. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, obviously you do it really loud, but you're supposed to attract the attention of all of the Daka Dakinis. Okay, so you, your three fingers, uh, your baby finger, ring finger, and middle finger up, the index fingers hook, and then that, uh, your thumbs touch like that. You come from your left hip up, circle three times, three times, and then in the center, pim, and it comes back. You just put your hands down to your, your right side, sort of like you pull it out of a holster and you put it back in a holster, but on the other hip, okay? And, uh, from my heart center, bum, radiates lights and invited from Agnishta uh, heaven. Agnishta is uh, in Tibetan, it's called Okmin. It is the highest of all of the pure realms. Uh, the holy Vajrayogini, surrounded by the host of gurus, contemplation de deities, uh, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, heroes, Dakinis, Dharma defenders, and worldly gods. Okay, so you invite everybody, okay? Uh, and then the guests from whom become a three-point Vajra with a light that straws that emerge. Now, you can do it in, in well, basically normally three colors. You do it white to pacify. You do it in gold or yellow color to increase. You do it in red color to be more influential. So when you're offering the inner offering, <coughs> uh, a cookie cake or a little glass of milk or whatever you do, a cookie, just whatever, then that, that you can feel that that is pulled up into their tongue, you know, with the three-pointed Vajra that, that is pulled into your tongue in a color that's appropriate to maybe the thing that you need. So to pacify, pacify problems, illnesses, uh, just obstacles, it's white. Uh, to increase lifespan, wisdom, merits, uh, and let's see, uh, it's, it's the same as the mantra for white Tara. Uh, and you put, okay, life, okay, so sorry, life, wisdom, merits, that's it, I guess that's, that's the things you increase. Okay, so that those yellow and then red is to be influential it means you can influence people in a constructive direction. That's red color to be attractive, makes you attractive. Okay, so that's what you do when you do the Ambadra Arli Ho Jahumba Mo Vajra Dakini Samyatam Sri Saya Ho. I do it three or seven times. You offering a primary to Vajrayogini and all of the, the, the Buddhas, all of the deities. Uh, and such. So you're offering to all of the <laughs> objects of refuge with the Vajra Arli Ho Jahom Bamho Vajra Dakini Samyadam Tri Sai Ho. Okay, now uh, there's a little thing that uh, we do in Mexico and it depends on you know the family and things like that. But you know when you when you're going to eat food it said you should offer. So if you're really into your Vajrayogini practice and it's appropriate with the people that you're with then you know you take refuge. So I, I do a small a sort of slightly uh, abbreviated refuge prayer. I take refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha from now until enlightenment. I will work for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings be happy. Okay. And then we do the Om Ahong Ha Ho Hri. Okay. So Om Ahong Ha Ho Hri. Om Ahong. Now you can do brief just Om Ahong, but it's fun to sort of do it with the mudra. Again, if you're with a bunch of other Vajrayogini practitioners, so you all go Om Ahong Ha Ho Hri. And then you do that three times. Okay, then you, you feel, you know, just you just feel Vajrayogini came, so you can pick up your the food plate and then you go, Om Vajra Arali Ho, Jahom Bamo, Vajra Dakini, Samyatam Sri Saya Ho. Okay, and then, then you can eat. Okay, and that way you, you, you do an offering. Uh, uh, that's for your food if you're drinking food and things. But again, it depends on the audience. You know, if there's people that it wouldn't be appropriate to do all of that, then better not to. But if it's just you and maybe uh, uh, some friends that are, Vajrayogini practitioners, and it's a little more fun, it makes it more fun. So that's, then the next one is the for all the worldly Dhaka Dakinis. And if you're not familiar with Sanskrit, it goes on kaka kahi kahi, which means eat, eat, please eat, please eat. So the very first line is om, which is integration, body, speech, and mind, and a blessing. Eat, eat, please eat, please eat. So kaka kahi kahi. 
then uh, I'm, I'm going to do the more sort of detailed version, but it's uh, later. But it's sarva yaksha raksha bhuta beta vishita. Okay, so sarva is all. Raksha is a certain type of spirit. Raksha is another type of spirit. Bhutas is ghosts. Pretas or pretas or hungry ghosts. Uh, and then all the other ones. And of course, I'll give you the, the way that you understand that in the um, long commentary. So basically, you're offering to all of the, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Okay. Uh, so you're making an offering to all of the, the ghosts and such that all, well, all the spirits, the ghosts, everybody, Om Vajradaka, Om Kakakai, Kai, Sarva, Yaksha, Raksha, Bhuta, Beta, Bishita, Anata, Vajradaka, Dagini, like that. And so you make that offering, just feel that the, the bliss of the thing goes to all the different realms and everybody gets very, very happy and stuff. You do that mantra two times. Then you make the eight offerings. Uh, water for the mouth, water for the feet, perfume, flowers, incense, light, food, and music. Okay, that's Aragam, Bajam, Busbe, Dubi, Alakan, Anyone is Shapta. Now, if you gain, have time, do it slowly. Remember, I explained earlier, I think it was last night possibly, that, that if you want to make a big memory in your mind, create a lot of, you could say, imprints in consciousness, include form, sound, smell, taste, and touch. You know, and, and the way that it was described when I did the neuroscience workshop was that if there's a really important memory that you want, uh, then, then you say, okay, what did I see? What did I hear? What smells were there? You know, what, what tastes were there? What, what sensations in my body? And by doing that in your brain, you're actually really, really expanding all the little, you know, neural pathways that this basically give you a memory. And we all know that in, uh, for example, people have Alzheimer's or such like that, those pathways get you know, dried up and they just don't work anymore. And that's why we can't remember. So uh, Lama Yeshi said to me and said actually to my mother, he said, if you do meditation and especially something like this, you know, you will, you will improve your brain function. You know, I mean, he said, and because she was afraid of getting, having Alzheimer's. So he said, no, do you do, do meditation, you'll have less damage from Alzheimer's. Why? Well, now there's again, there's scientific proof with mindfulness meditation that actually your brain grows and that sections of your brain will grow, will improve. Um, it's, it's again, very, very interesting uh, neuroscience and what it's coming up with about the brain and how it's affected. I mean, there's substantial statistics that just mindfulness has a huge benefit for you. Okay. So, I mean, we have mindfulness because we should be mindful in our practice but we have then things which even enhance it which is you know deities and you know symbols which represent enlightenment so we're doing a, an incredible blessing to our consciousness to do these things so again they, they, you do the lotus roll remember you always send out goddess and goddesses they make the offerings you pull them back for each offering if you're doing it slowly enough and therefore you you feel that your heart chakra is opening so it's, uh, you send them out and right hand is up, left hand is down, send them out. Then the way I like to do it is if I have a balloon, I go, and this is sort of coarse, but it's okay. Right hand goes down, left hand up, up holding the balloon. Uh, right hand comes up, pushes the balloon away and your hands roll over and you make the offering. So, Om Vajra Yogini Savare Vara. Aragam hum soha. Now, at first, you will have a little bit of trouble coordinating hands and thinking energy comes out, energy comes back in, but that's because of a lack of familiarity. As you get more familiar, then it's much more easy. But again, it does require these offering mudras or things be a little bit slow. You know, so doing it really fast. I mean, often when you're in a hurry, it's om bhajyogini savare wari water for the mouth, water for the feet, perfume, flowers, or say flowers, since light, perfume, food, music, you know, which is okay, it's not bad. But the thing is, is that if you would like to make a bigger imprint and the meaning of the imprint, like it's not just imprint, but you're offering to, you know, Vajrayogini, you know, enlightenment and your Vajrayogini, you know, with all the qualities. So putting all that together, it means, you're creating incredibly good imprints on your consciousness. Excuse me. 
Okay, then uh, inner offering, Om Bajri Vinyasa Vare Vare, left hand, Om uh, Hom, ring finger and thumb. Uh, I don't really know, it, it, you know, it says uh, Vajogini and Haruka, they touch, it could, be, it could be the reverse, it doesn't really matter. But the thing is, it's a male and female deity, they touch in this great bliss. And that's the bliss that you offer. Then you say the praise, O glorious Vajradakini, universal queen of Dakinis, with five wisdoms and three bodies incarnate, savior of all beings, I bow down. And of course, the, the FPMT prayer to Vajogini like that would be different, but it's just, they're all praise. Your emanation, Vajradakinis, ladies who, pro who progress the world's work, who free us from the bondage of pre uh, presumptions, I bow to you all. So they're, they can just, it's appreciating the, the, uh, the, the Vajra, Vajra, see, Vajrayogini and all of the Dakinis of you know, the 24 sacred places and such, all of them. Thank you very much. Please help us in our path. Now, in the long sadhana, you, this is where you do the prayer for the, to see the Dakini's lovely face. Um, if you're doing a short sadhana, and that's quite short and quick to do, it's just, I think it's maybe like 10 pages long, nothing much. You could insert this just before you do your calm, a calm abiding meditation. This is very meaningful. Now, this will be something I'll teach extensively. So let's say uh, it says here, in the theater of the bliss void of infinite victors, you show all appropriate <coughs> visions of life and liberty. Um, here now, O oh beautiful queen of Dakini angels, uh, my heart recalls you, sustain me with the blissful play of your embrace. Okay. So again, there's lots of commentary on this and I don't want to go into it now because it'll take a lot of time and I'll do it tonight or I'll do it in a few nights. So you, you go through all of that uh, and it's, it's very meaningful. Then, so then you've concluded that prayer. prayer. Then you say a prayer uh, to attain your personal goals. Please, O holy Vajra Yagini, may you take me and all beings to the heavenly land of Dakinis. Please bestow on us every single mundane and transcendental accomplishment. So you may be familiar that if you keep your commitments perfectly, now the, the main one would be saying her mantra every day for however many numbers you promised. The uh, second one, of course, is doing soak every two weeks. Now that sometimes can be difficult uh, you know, if for example, I mean, in Mexico, we find it hard to be able to have like the soak is sometimes it's a Monday night, sometimes it's a Wednesday night, sometimes it's a weekend, you know, because it moves around according to the Tibetan lunar calendar. So uh, what we do is just every Sunday we do soak. Now that doesn't, you know, it's not maybe coinciding perfectly with the uh, 10th and 25th according to the Tibetan <coughs> calendar. But you know we are making soak to Bajogini every week at the Dharma Center as a group. Um, what you can do on the days that it is Vajrayogini's day, or you know tenth and twenty fifth, that's Guru Padmasab, Guru Padmasambhava soak, and then Vajrayogini soak. It doesn't really matter the names; it's the same date. Um, but then you basically double your mantras. Um, there is this other commentary that says you can give a, a candy to a young virgin child, and that qualifies. But nowadays, it'll most likely get you arrested, <laughs> you know. So unless it happens to be your niece or nephew or something, so it's better that basically you just stop your mantras. Um, you know, the change of the, the the politics of life change. So anyway, then you you do so you make the request, and if you keep your commitments, when you die, you'll be met by the Daka Dakinis Haruka Chakrasambara, and you'll be taken to the Pure Land, where then you can continue to practice, or you could say, well, I'd like to come back and take a rebirth. So it's not like once you go to a pure land, you're gonna be there forever. You could come back into the world and take a rebirth and continue your practice. And the commentary is this, is that in pure lands, nothing really challenges you, although you can continue to practice. But if you wanna be challenged and actually transform a lot quicker, come back, take a rebirth. Because of course we all know life is challenging. So. Please take me and all beings to the heavenly land of the Dakinis. Okay, so uh, keeping your commitments and the, uh, you know, all of the, all of the commitments of the five Buddha families and such is the best of your ability. You know, we're not perfect, but we do the best of our ability. Vajravini and will, will meet us. Now, I have some interesting stories. Uh, and again, it's better I'll tell them now because it's just we're just reviewing the sadhana. Uh, one of my very good friends who was in India from back in 1973 or something like that. 
<clears throat> he said when he was a young boy, um, one night he had this dream and suddenly in his dream, he's sitting on the bed of his grandmother and, and she's talking to him very nicely in this very nice dream, you know. And then at a certain point, he said, in my dream, the whole roof of this room opened up two archangels, you know, because his grandmother was Christian, came down and said, it's time to go. And said his grandmother then floated off the bed and the two angels took it to each side of her. And then she went up into space and then he woke up. And so in the morning he went to his mummy and he said, mother, I think grandmother died last night. And the mother was like a big shock, phoned and sure enough, the grandmother died that night. So I, I always take that story as being, whoa, that woman had a lot of faith. And so she went to heaven, pure land. And she in her, in her, in her, however it would be. And here's the boy, five years old, having, you know, due to connections and maybe some purity of being a young child, has that, that, that vision or that dream with his grandmother. So uh, I always take that as a big inspiration for like having sincere practice. And that when I do uh, come to the end of my life, that may, may I really, you know, be met by Haruka Majubini and then playing music and such like that. And we all go to the pure land. And so there I can continue my practice. That's one story. Now there's another story. And this one's even better because it's about Lama Zopa. And so uh, there's a very good friend of mine. He's in Mexico. He's very, very enthusiastic about tantric practice and such and so things. So uh, he, 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 took many, he took many initiations from me, like Yamantaka, Heruka. I don't know if he took Majokini, but he took several and things. Uh, and then I, in talking, I said, well, if you really want to, you know, be, you know, have a big experience, we'll go to India and Nepal. So I said, oh, yeah. So off he went to uh, Nepal. And there, um, he was a little bit sort of Gelupa Nyingmapa. So he got a Nyingmapa Lama and he said, please, I want the POA practice, like how to transfer consciousness. And so the Lama said, yes, of course, we can do that. So then he gave him you know, the full transmission of Amitabha's pure land and the mantra and all of the related prayers that you would do and things like that. And he was just so happy. And then uh, he was a Mexican. So then one day uh, a group of Mexicans were in Kathmandu and they said, oh, we have an audience with Lama Zopa. Would you like to come with us? And he said, sure. You know, he, he was sort of in the Enigma side when he was like that. So anyway, he went up and, you know, he, he sort of, he was tagging along. He wasn't really, you know, part of the, that, that group, but they were friends. So anyway, they all came in, they did three prostrations. There's about eight or nine of them, you know, in the room with Lama Zopa. He sat at the back. And so he's sitting there and, and so they're, they're talking away and this and that. And then suddenly with no comment from him about who he was or what he was doing or anything, suddenly Lama Zopa says, oh, if you practice Amitabha's Pure Land, you'll never practice Tantra because Amitabha Buddha doesn't teach Tantra. And then he went back to carrying on the conversation. <laughs> so my friend was like, you know, I love Tantra. You know, what have I done to myself? So I'm one of his teachers. So he emailed back to me. He says, Jampa, Jampa, what do I do? You know, all of this has happened. So I says, well, you have to go back to the Nyingmapa Lama and say, um, please, I'd like to return the commitment I have with you for the Amitabha Pure Land. And I'd like to get, the, you know, whatever one. So I'm not sure what, what Pure Land practice he got, but he got one that would take him to the, pure land of the Daka Dakinis. So anyway, I share that. One is because uh, Lama Zopa, he, you know, I'll be honest, he's quite an eccentric Lama. I mean, if you've attended teachings, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but he's very holy. I really, I mean, if I think you want the true authentic Buddha Dharma with no adulteration, that's Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Just, just he will teach you that perfectly. The, uh, in 1971, in uh, March, um, I, I, I met Lama Yeshi in January. He brought me up to Kathmandu uh, and stuff. And then Zina organized the very, very, very first uh, retreat with Lama Zopa, you know, with Lama Zopa teaching it and stuff. And so there was about 12 or 14 of us attending just in the old house of Kopan. And so, uh, you, know, he, he, you know, we were all sort of waiting, you know, for the teachings and some of them had been, you know, with other teachers and then we're sort of all excited. And so Lama Zopa sat down on the first day and started talking about the three lower realms. And he talked for seven days in a row about all the hells and all the different realms of the three lower realms, and just like the hells, you know, that was it. And I remember there was, a, I think it was Gina and Paul, he was, he was an American and she was an Italian 
they were attending and they said, what's this all about? You know, where's Mahamudra? You know, I didn't come here to get here about the hells. I mean, I'm from Italy, you know, there's, I have enough Catholicism in me, you know. Anyway, so that's Lamazopa. He did that. And why? Because if you look at the Buddha Dharma, you have to have, uh, let's see, apprehension to take a bad rebirth. And so you should really know about bad rebirths. And when you really know about a bad rebirth, you say, I don't want to go there. And then you start practicing Dharma to make sure you take a good rebirth. I mean, there's logic in it. It's just that, you know, for Western culture, um, you know, it's sort of like we've already been beaten by the hell realms enough. And then, you know, I mean, and, and most of us will have the story of, you know, if you don't, aren't, don't, if you don't please God, he's going to send you to hell for eternity, you know, so sort of like it's not as an effective tool anymore. But they say Lama Sopa did it. And then for those of you, we, us in FPMT, we know Lama Sopa taught precious human rebirth for years in the three lower realms for years and things like that. Because he's very pure. He teaches Buddha Dharma. <coughs> you know, and we all know if we were teaching students with Lama Yeshi, he taught bliss and void. <laughs> they were very complimentary sort of. Lama Sopa would take you through the three lower realms and Lama Yeshi would come in and say, bliss and happiness and love. And then you go back to the three lower realms. Anyway, uh, very precious teachers. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure those of you that are FPMT students know exactly what I'm talking about. So coming back to the main point uh, that first off, I, I, I have supreme faith of Lama Sopa Rinpoche as an incredibly holy being. Uh, and again, my friend uh, from Mexico, uh, you know, did not take a rebirth or he's not died yet, but he will not take a rebirth in Amitabha's Pure Land. He will go to the Dakini Pure Land where he'll be much more happy. So then you have the, uh, so you've done the Vajra Arli Hoza, Hum Bum Ho, and the, those mantras. Then you do offerings to to the uh, various, uh, you know, well, let's say protectors and such, uh, which is in the thing. So that's where you do the, again, if you, uh, if you have the little, offering of milk on the altar this is specifically for that so or a cookie or a candy or just your inner offering any of those are suitable om ah hum ha ho hri and again we'll go through the detail on how to do that mudra hum and then you do all the prayers to the highest heaven of great bliss palace glorious praja mahakala chief protector of the teachings vairachana's powerful heart emanation etc i won't read it all because it's not necessary so it goes through all of the different protectors from all over the different parts of India. And so that at the light, final line is, may you preserve the awesomeness of Buddha's teachings. May you intensify the reverence of the three, may you, intensif, may you intensively uh, the reverence of given to the three jewels. May you magnify the uh, beneficial work of the glorious gurus. May you accomplish the goals that are gained by the, us, the yogis. So you do that. Then you do the Heruka mantra. And so then you, then you feel, uh, sometimes you just do have to do it once. Sometimes you do it three times, it depends. But the point is, is that that purifies. Okay, you brought all these entities in front of you. And so because we sometimes can have a less than qualified ability, we feel that they're all washed by the Heruka Vajrasatha mantra. So all beings are washed of our errors. Whatever I have done incorrectly, due to not finding the proper materials, not fully knowing, or lack of ability, please tolerate all of this. Now, I, pre I have something I do, and this is a jampa thing again. I want to always emphasize if I'm making a jampa thing versus what the tradition has. <coughs> if you really are, you know, a sincere practitioner and you do the hooking mudra, okay, hooking mudra's left hand is palm up, two fingers out, that's a wrathful mudra, but it's palm up, the right hand wrathful mudra, but palm down, you hook your index finger to your left hand's baby finger, and you hook, and you say, you know, from the hung of my heart, light rays emanate, bringing forth in the space before me, all the gurus, buddhas, bodhisattvas, etc. You do that, that, that's, you feel that you hook them, that they have no, say, ability to uh, not be hooked. <coughs> the other side is also all local spirits, you know, you hook them, and so suddenly, you know, I mean, spirits in various different parts so that are they're pulled and their attention is pulled because of you. And if you have sincere faith, I mean, you should think that they really do get 
hooked, you know, attracted. And then, of course, you make offerings to them and say, you know, hey, my Dharma practice, please help me do it well, whatever, you know, please be beneficial, please make the neighborhood good, make everybody happy, uh, things like that. Those are your standard requests to both Buddhas and to local spirits and such. So having done all of that, then you say, I'm so sorry if I made any errors, you know, water here, how many of I do that. Then what I do is, well, if I hook them in physically, why don't I let them go? So this is again the thing I just do right hand and thumb and first finger, Om Bhadra Mu. You know, I release them. And I don't think any Lama would particularly uh, say that I was wrong, but having done a three-year retreat, having lived in the mountains and stuff and <coughs> pulled deities, you know, out of, out of wherever I might've been able to, I'm not saying I did, but I tried. <laughs> just that it was important just to let them go because I'd hooked them, I let them go. So again, that's just a jump ism but I think it has some, some re relevance. Then the ritual cake uh, gets uh, dissolved in the world of years and the spirits return to their own abodes. So that's, uh, they send everybody away. And then you do the praises. So by the virtue, may I quickly achieve the actuality of the heavenly uh, Dakini realm and may every being without exception be established in that state. At the time of my death, okay, now this is a very important one. At the time of my death, may the Lord's heroes and Dakini hosts Offer me flowers, hold up umbrellas and banners, play music and cymbals and sweet voices and so forth. Take me to the heavenly land of Dakinis. Uh, by the truths of the authentic goddesses, the authentic commitments and the utterly authentic words, because they become the cause for every one of us to be uh, looked after by these goddesses. Okay, so there, there's your three requests. Then there's just a long series, which is a graduated path and the tantric path sort of spelt out. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it. That, that'll possibly, we'll be able to do that on Sunday. I, I'm sort of wondering how much I can teach. I, I don't wanna rush through things, but anyway, so that'll be the, the final part. Uh, you do all of those prayers and you do the auspicious prayers. You know, may everything be wonderful and beautiful. Uh, and that's it, then you finished. So remember, this is just a review of the sadhana uh, to sort of give you a, a simple way of sort of looking at the different components of the sadhana and uh, seeing, seeing what's, what's being done. <clears throat> okay, so that concludes that what, what we're doing. So tomorrow morning, we will read the long sadhana. Um, I don't know if we'll read all of it to the, uh, all of the auspicious prayers and such, but we'll read the long sadhana together. That'll be the morning uh, session. And then the afternoon again, we'll do it again. Uh, maybe we'll just focus on certain components, do it slowly, uh, you know. So between now and, and Sunday, the, after, the morning and afternoon session will be uh, the sadhana, the recitations. Maybe we can do one section and just meditate on that and then another section, but without too much commentary. Every evening, uh, we will be doing the different yogas. So the evening class from well, six o'clock in England through till about 8.30, uh, we will do the uh, long commentary with all the details. Um, I'll try very hard to be to complete it all so that you don't miss anything. But you know, it's uh, the, the really the more important thing for I would say most of us is the fundamentals that you really get it down that I come from Dharmakaya and I am Bodhicitta. I work for the benefit of sentient beings. I manifest. If you get start getting that in place, you'll have a very good life, you know. I mean, you'll have context for your life. And remember that if you just think of one rebirth and say, oh, this is all about this rebirth, you know, and, and you've been nice to me and you haven't been nice to me and this and that, then such a limited view. And not that it's, you know, really necessary to be even future lives, but all religions have them, so it must be something there, okay? That if you then say, oh, I'm a Bodhisattva practitioner, I'm cultivating rebirth by rebirth towards enlightenment. And with that thought then, okay, in this rebirth, there's particular stuff manifesting. Well, let me work on it. I, I've shared before also the idea of that we don't remember our past life. We don't remember the name of the person. We don't remember the place we were born. We don't remember what we did or how we died. None of those, generally speaking, I'd say 95% of us are in that category. So that means the next person in line will have exactly the same. They won't remember that it was Jampa, that Jampa did this and that and blah, blah, blah. But what they will have is the karmic continuity of who I was, the karmic activity. And so therefore, 
if you do a good job with getting divorced, being bankrupt, having problems, having cancer, you know, you do, you do a good job dealing with them effectively, bringing all activities into the path, you're making a huge present for the next guy in the next rebirth, the next man or woman in the next rebirth. You know, really, it's, it's a gift. And if that person in the next rebirth happens to uh, become a Buddhist, they'll turn around and say, thank you, past life. You did a good job. Or <laughs> if you don't do much, you know, and, and you really didn't solve your problems with the people that, you know, you tried to have a relationship with and there's failures and you didn't do very well in school because you didn't study very hard. And, and you know, just, uh, you know, maybe sometimes you lied and sometimes you stole or whatever, you know, you know, and then the next rebirth, that person, you know, they're trying to be a Buddhist because there's some karma for that, but they have all these problems. Then they can turn around and say that, you know, previous rebirth the guy was a schmuck you know <laughs> anyway, i'm just joking but the thing no so you know really think about it in terms of i'm cultivating a gift for the next rebirth i, I know in the standard teachings we always say work for the future rebirth okay and i you know i i used to sort of think in those terms a bit but then i realized like i just said the next rebirth's not going to know me and so hey, make some gifts for that next rebirth. And then it becomes an act of generosity, which is a really nice feeling. I'm, I study hard. My next rebirth will have an easy time in school. I'm good in relationships. I, you know, I don't project a lot of expectations or whatever might be the issue, you know? Hey, the next one's gonna have a good relationship, you know? But I want it to be spirituality. I want to bring spirituality into my life and into the life of the people in my life. So again, you'll be more attracted to people with a greater context and maybe with altruism. Now, those are beautiful gifts to send to the next rebirth. Okay, anyway, so I'm just concluding. Uh, the, this is the last class, which was a review of the Sedona. Um, we'll publish it that way so that you'll know you'll have a total of, uh, we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We have eight classes on a review of the Sedona. So those are available. They'll be on the YouTube channel. Uh, please share that with anybody that seems appropriate, that is, who has the initiation and does what you're getting practice. Okay. So uh, we can just meditate a little bit, take a comfortable posture. Okay. So we're going to meditate. Always take a deep breath before you start, just helps you settle down a little bit. See yourself, you know, the identity of Vajogini. That means I'm coming from Dharmakaya because of, you know, my bodhicitta may I be of benefit than my Sarbhogakaya and Ramanakaya. That puts this small rebirth into an incredibly good context. It's the field where I practice the Dharma, this rebirth. And uh, please meditate on whatever part of the sadhana that you sort of have particular interest and joy in.
Bring your awareness back to your breathing. And bring your meditation, the Vajogini, to a positive conclusion with happiness. If you're happy, you greatly increase your karma. Be happy that we did the practice of Vajogini, the review of the Sadhana today. Maybe you attended this morning, include that. You can include all the activities of the past days, all the potential future activities. And I dedicate that completely to having a more enlightened life and finding complete enlightenment. And the meaning of that enlightenment is an offering to all sentient beings, generosity, principles, patience, joy, peace, and wisdom. May all our gurus live extremely long lives and always be a great benefit. May there be peace in the world. Okay. So thank you very much. See you tonight.